16 minutes past eight, you were watching out to AM. That was a close one, wasn't it? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Uh, we don't need we can move on from that one. David Snage, football writer of the 42. Good morning to you. Good morning. What's your, actual, what's your actual title? I'm very well. Pardon? <laughs> what's your actual title? Um, uh, I don't know. Employed. Oh, yeah. That, in journalism. <laughs> I'll take that, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, was last night, you were out there last night, were you? No, I wasn't. I was doing something else. I was actually working on a feature. Believe it or not, um, that's his new job. Different, different watch, board, uh, watch the space. Yeah, but um, no, I watched the match. Yeah. Was last night a like evidence that Rovers should have gone for it a bit more? And I know obviously some of the bigger names weren't weren't there. And it's the constant after every game we find ourselves talking about it. But yeah. like last night, they bank more money than they win for winning the the League of Ireland season. The League of Ireland is wrapped up, and I know there was a couple of injuries and stuff like that. But like, was last night? Ah, oh, that's great. And, and they got the job done and again they showed they were at that level or was it like oh, could we just have done this a little bit more during the stages I think there's an element of both both aspects of that my own reading of it just from speaking to people at Rovers and then even just listening to Stephen Bradley this week after obviously they won the league look we were out in Mar- um, Broadstone, or Broadstone Ro- Roadstone uh, the day after they won it and he made the point that he was like this is something playing in Europe that sh- the club shouldn't have to wait another 10-11 years for mm. And then that kind of ties in from what you're hearing from when you speak to people because it is very much a case of rowers putting plans in place here. Mm. Like it's not a case of right, they qualify for Europe, they have to go hell for leather and lash into it because they're never going to be here again and you never know when it's going to happen again. There's very much a sense that this is something that's part of, and it's, it's a word that was mocked when Bradley Force came in, but the process, mm. like this is what they're building towards to be on a regular basis. So while... I would say the one game would be moulded away when I thought, you know what, uh, that's when he actually threw the towel in a little bit and I accepted, you know what, uh, yeah. the league was more important. And That was the term I used. Shelburne on the Sunday, was, it, was yeah, that the week? Yeah. Like, Which they on- won with the last minute winner. Yeah, and like to be honest, like fans, fans I'd say would be looking at that thinking, do you know what, there should have been maybe a stronger team out there, but that t- it ties in with where Rovers are trying to go at the moment, whereby it's like, this isn't going to be the only time we're going to be here. Like, mm. their thinking and their pro- thought process is, but winning the league and the champions path and the way that helps in terms of the seed and all the rest of it, that they'll be in the Conference League again next year. Mm. They're not going to be banking on that, obviously, but that's what they're aiming towards. That's what they're building towards. And it's that it's that kind of thought process of, do you know what, yeah, we've qualified, that's great, mm. but this is still part of the early stages of what our plan is, the medium to long-term plan of continued European football. So to project forward into that, because there was a quote from during the week where he said, "If you take the groups, this is in the context of the League of Ireland. If you take the group stages out of it, the Conference League, uh, we're hard to beat." I took that as a if they get back into it again next year, they may end up just doing the same thing again. They, well, I don't know. If, I, I don't think they should if they do because it, it, the money that they've made this year, and even when you tie into say money that would have come in say from Gavin Bazoon who sailed the add-ons and, and mm. the, the money that would come in there like, I think there's a couple of million coming their way from that as well like Andy Lyons leaving going to Blackpool there's a few, a few more quid coming in there as well then you've got the natural that's investment that's already in the club um, obviously with Dermot Desmond and how they've kind of set up is there as well and 6,000 odd a week every Friday and, night and that's it as well like you see the, what the average crowd is and like they, they they have to not an element of massive rebuilding but they do have to add in a couple of bodies in terms of freshening up the squad and that's going to be needed they've already worked on that I think there's a couple maybe three already down the line that will be pretty much sorted relatively soon you would imagine but again it just comes into that it seems to be coming into that point where and it's kind of hard it's kind of hard I don't mean this in a bad way but like Rovers are just acting like a proper professional club in terms of actual forward planning mm. that yeah they have a bit of success and it's not right what do we do here now how do we what how do we keep this going? Like what they're doing now is it's within the framework and within the plan that they've what they've put in place, you know. And like Johnny, Johnny you were saying there about the six thousand, like it's every every other League of Ireland fan would probably not like the fact that Rowers are doing this. But what Rowers are doing between connecting with a fan base and everything with the youth structures and with how they now do actually focus on that first team, it's the perfect model. Mm-hmm. It really is. And when you tie in that they've got a manager who's not even 40 he's 37 years old and he's already won three, three league titles in a row already has European experience and like it's we- interest and- yeah and that and listen that's that's the only element that is I suppose with, that could maybe throw things off course with Rovers is, is obviously when other people come in but we're, we're hard on ourselves as well in the League of Ireland right? Oh, come here. you know we're, but, but sometimes we're too hard on ourselves in the sense that like the 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 economic suicide and 
basket case reality of the League of Ireland is gone. Like, and this is a league where there's no prize money, and you know we, we you know we get kind of miffed by comments about like from England about how we are relative to England. England is full of clubs who are run as economic basket cases, mm -hmm. right? Or losing so much money, going out of business. The League of Ireland in general is in a good place, and Rovers are an example of that. And you have like if you've Dermot Desmond investing in something, let's be honest here, he sees something that that's worth investing in. You have like. A, you, and even if when you have billionaire owners like they're, they're three billionaire if not four billionaire owners in the league now those clubs being Derry City and Galway United are still being run prudently and even Galway United this season our average crowd is going to be over 2,000 uh, a week in the first division and uh, these clubs are being run like sensibly despite the fact that we've no prize money coming from above and like you say that about being hard on ourselves and you kind of get the sense like if you think of what if you think of Stephen Bradley I'm just mentioning this I just I genuinely think that his kind of story is one of the great Irish football stories at the moment in terms of like I remember doing a feature with him for four four two with him and Stephen McPhail um, a few years ago and he told the story when he was coming through and like he spoke with this before how he was like lauded as a as a young player everyone wanted him but like Alex Ferguson coming to his house in Tallaght and arriving and he's out. Like he's late coming in because he's playing football on the street with his mates, whatever. And he goes for for dinner in town with Alex Ferguson, and then he comes back and eventually he signs for Arsenal. And he's spoken about obviously the attack and everything that happened, but how he was able to rebuild his life after that. When you think about how it could have easily gone a completely different way. What if Rover sacked? Well, as well? The, but that's, that's the, the other, other element thing. to it. Like, like he, he, but he comes back and all he comes back and plays in the league and all, and then like he retires early. He didn't have to. He retired because mm. he just had fallen out with love of playing football. Really, he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do mm. and then just that like he took over he took over as a caretaker over 31 years of age when Rovers were a bit of a basket case they really were like they were short it was short hand they were sack of managers like there was no there didn't seem to be any kind of full on plan and he helped drive it at that age and has now started delivering success and like, I genuinely think he just de deserves a tremendous amount of respect for what he has done and that and then when you throw in this year the emotion behind everything and he's spoken about his son and how he'd been diagnosed with, with leukaemia and like he was out talking about that to us on, on Tuesday and like literally I was sitting beside him it tears me eyes listening mm. to him because like you're thinking about what he's gone through and, and how he's described and stuff and it's just it's hard to comp or genuinely hard to comprehend how he's got through this year. I have yeah. no idea how. And well, I have. It's because of his family and it's because of the staff he was talking about. And the players as well. Like I think the players really like they they were men and like they were good people. They were like we're going to do this for him and yeah. we're going to rally around him. And like I think I have to do law the Rovers board when they lost five two against Dundalk. If you canvassed a uh, thousand people across Ireland, they're like, Bradley should go, it's not working out. But they had the banner, didn't they? Remember, they had the banner at Tallinn, remember, that Yeah, the banner, it's time is up, whatever. They stuck with him. And I think he was a young manager, he was with young coaching staff. And from my experience of having dealt with them, I think they've learned on the job as well, as you would expect. And Rovers. I think Rovers, like they lost their riches from 2011, they basically squandered that and they realise now that we're going to do this a little bit longer term and they had Stephen Kenny, they had uh, Pat Fenlon in, they had Trevor Crawley in. Brian Laws. <laughs> yeah, Brian Laws and I was like, we need to give this man time and I'm glad they did because this was a story that never happened. All these titles could be four in a row, would never happened if they sacked him and most people probably would have said they should have. They stuck with him. You're talking about the players like... I just thought it was the, the way he was describing it, the image of if Pico Lopez gave Josh uh, Stephen yeah. Bradley's son his jersey after yeah. one of the games and when he got because he went to Tala Austin he went to Talca Park during the match during the week just because he didn't want to know what was going on between Derry and Sligo but then like Josh is wearing and he arrives in he's wearing Pico Lopez's jersey and he says it's like a nightdress on him and he's sleeping on it and sleeping in it and that just kind of sums up the kind of sense that's actually at that club at the moment, you know. There's a I lovely there story line as well, yeah. That, I, that, that story that you wrote uh, during mm. the week with him from that uh, from that piece, and it really encompasses everything you're talking about about how he's he was at Talca Park and his wife yeah. brings him to give him the news and the how outspoken he's been with the playing group of uh, about Josh and about the condition and. That in itself was jeez, I it yeah. made me stop a second and go, wow! That, I, I was surprised that he would be as place the story as central to what was going on as he has done. I suppose you think about it like it just kind of plays into how his life has been in terms of what some of the stuff that's happened to him and by speaking about stuff that's obviously clearly worked for him you know and mm -hmm. just that modern day it's the, most, like, the modern day manager or coach where you connect with your players on two levels remember the whole thing of you don't want to get too close to your players you don't want to be seen as their best mate and obviously he's not their, all their best mate because he has to make tough decisions but the fact he's able to keep that group of players seemingly very content with the amount of rotation that happens, it just shows you that he do, he's, 
they're not doing it just because of their success there. Like it's clearly because they actually buy into what he's doing and they respect him as a person. And that just seems to be one of the core kind of pillars of how he goes about things is that it's not right if you have a problem you box it off just concentrate on football maybe that could have been there in early stages and as Johnny was saying you learn the job and you realise how players take really mm. but it just seems to be that openness is what's driving it really he was like he was confident enough to start the season I said how how are you keeping all these lads happy like and he yeah. said it's not my job to keep them happy and I was like yeah you're actually right here but they have to want to play for you it's but, that's it, so <laughs> as in, but like it's not my, my role is not keeping players happy my role is to win get things for Shamrock Rovers yeah. and, and whatever way he's managed it maybe keeping them happy is is not exactly representing what's going on, but the point He's is that like, sometimes they can obviously... And not, unhappiness can lead to... Not losing the dressing room and all that. And the, yeah. like, Rovers have complex individuals in that dressing room, like any other dressing room, maybe more than other dressing rooms, and somehow, if they're not happy, they've won the league again in a canter, and um, they've, they've done it. Like, and, you know, the, the players that... Who else are they going to bring in, and where are they going to go? And uh, because they will raise their standards next season again. Oh, they will. It's natural. And it, it, it was telling though when 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 Stephen Bradley was asked about has everything that's happened this year with his family and all the rest. Maybe he said if something was to come up abroad, be it England or elsewhere, would that not would that basically rule you out? And he, he said, no. Listen, if something comes up, you obviously have to mm. you have to kind of look at it and and kind of di- and see where you stand with it. But like. That's the, that, that would be the big thing and in terms of... And you would imagine Rovers, let's be honest, like they would have had that sense where... Because obviously Dermot Desmond got involved in that during the summer when Lincoln were coming in for, for Stephen Bradley and helped helped just kind of ease the situation a little bit and that kind of convinced them to stay. But they you would think that's kind of given them that little bit of a jolt to say, well, hold on, you need to have some kind of succession plan in place here in terms of having some people to come in because it is very much a case that it's a kind of collaborative effort at Rovers as well obviously Bradley is the main man but you've got Stephen McPhail there who's the technical director but he's on the bench for every game as well it's not as if he's just maybe yeah. the board's man and is like separate things he will be very much intricate he'll be massively Brad- important yeah and obviously Glenn Cronin Glenn Cronin as well so it's it, that element that's the element like, like any club that's successful especially at the level where Rovers are at where yeah within the League of Ireland they're the main, they're the main team at the moment but in the field chain the greater scheme of things it wouldn't take it would take a, like a club to come in and get him, and they could have done. It's not as if this is the job of a, of a lifetime where you can never turn it down. You know what I mean? Final thing on that is it just I, I think the six thousand odd that Rovers are getting Friday night. I think a lot of this is to do with the fact that it's very good football to watch. Like it's actually entertaining. It's a nice stadium. It's good football to watch. And League of Ireland managers aren't going to England anymore. League of Ireland managers have to pit themselves against Stephen uh, Bradley, Stephen O'Donnell, Damien Duff. Um, Rory Higgins, Tim Clancy, John Russell, and all these other managers, and it's a league that has its own like micro kind of quality about it now. Where this is our league, and we have to better each other, and we're not really worrying about England as much anymore. And I hope that's a good thing. It's mad as well. Colin Healy be coming up as a manager, yeah, with if he's, and he's one of the older lads now. He's forty two. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He has like, to sign a new contract. Like so, well, yeah, next season is going to be it. class. Like it's yeah. going to be practically full time, and some of the personalities involved. Stephen Kenny was in the stands last night. Who was he? Who was who? And he had a notepad out. Who was he checking it? Well, he's been on record, and you kind of it's, it's, it's always interesting with Stephen Kenny. I think because you kind of know where his thinking is at because he'll throw names at you when like you wouldn't have even expected them, or you haven't kind of maybe led him down a certain path or tried to say, well, get his, your thoughts on a certain player. But Neil Ferdowsia is the one he keeps on going back to, and you you got glimpses of it last night where just that powerful running, probably the one thing that Rovers do lack. At that level, you were saying at the start, of Adrian about they've shown that they're well capable, and they have been. It's just been maybe just that little bit of pace, a little bit of power that they're just lacking, maybe at a very at that level, and um, to kind of in the final tours, especially to actually kind of cut through teams. And Ferrugia is the one I think. I'm like, delighted for him because I genuinely oh, the injuries thought, he's I had as well. His was done. Yeah. I actually did, and he qualifies for Malta as well and France and, and France. Well, I think he had a better chance to play for Malta. He's better chance to play for Malta. There's, there's, there's nothing France, that uh, and he nothing, got like 600 in the leaving as well. Nothing that excites us more than uh, like, oh, gee, could we go on somewhere else? Mm. We get us lock him down. We've great track record, of course. Now I'll be a bit of a hypocrite now. He plays a couple of times for Malta and then declares for Ireland. But like, but I think he will be the one in terms of and even that position because he can play. You could play as that kind of maybe like left wing back, and the reason why I say Ferrugia, and I'm more so because I actually asked Kenny this about Andy Lyons around the time he was going to Blackpool, because Andy Lyons obviously had a great kind of season with um, with Rovers, and he actually said no, Ferrugia is the one, yeah. so he'd be one I would say yeah. that if um, especially with the friendlies coming up, maybe he could be in with a show if he can stay fit. Hopefully, left well. wing back is still kind of yeah. up for grabs. Ronaldo's back; he's fully into the team ethic. It's everything is turning up uh-huh. Millhouse. Is that right? <laughs> 
Oh no, well the fans were singing Viva Ronaldo last night, weren't they? What's Ronaldo, this yeah. celebration all about? I don't know. I don't know. Is sleeping, he kind of sleeping? He did it against Everton. Yeah. Didn't he? So is he kind of just that? Is he at peace that where his Sue career is gone? Isn't yeah. He's at peace. Is that it? Uh, well, I don't think he's at I peace mean. where his career is. That what it was the last week or so. It won't have happened, but ah, it's just pantomime stuff, really, isn't it? Mm. It's um. They they feel like they're getting fixed though. Yeah. No. That's this is, but actually, and in, in fairness, so it's actually doing a piece for the, at the weekend for the 42 on this because I just thought remember when Keane was talking about this on Sunday with Sky and it felt as if the world was falling in he was like it was if you know what just, he just has to go now when he said it against City that this is going to be a problem and it clearly it has been but it felt as if he's never going to play for United again this is an outrage Gary Neville is in throwing his um, usual stuff in and then by the middle by, by the Monday he's back training hmm. Like he's at the like he's all small as a Ten Hag training with the open training session before, then he starts and he scores. So in less than a week, Ten Hag has managed to actually like just totally squash this. Master stroke. Genuinely, I think and listen, listen, you're not in the dressing room, you don't know what even Ten Hag's thinking is and some of the stuff well, that's done, being said. Though, isn't he? Ronaldo. Ronaldo's done. Like, I mean, he's playing him against Sheriff, so he's like, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's you would really imagine good. so. Like he wanted to leave during the summer. The United were happy for him to go and the offers didn't come. Like, you know, and like the fact that the offers didn't come and they weren't able to get rid of him in good time to actually try and find any kind of replacement. Ten Hag has just shown what most top managers would be where you have that sense of this is what you want to do but then an element of pragmatism has to come into it where you, how you deal with the situation. Mm. That's what he's been doing and I just I just I just thought it was gas when Keane threw through Paul Scholes under the bus when he oh, brought up about quietly going about his day and suddenly yeah. <laughs> But then but then the reason why and uh, there's, there's this book, have you read the new book about um the ninety nine treble season that Matt Dickinson has done? Yeah. And I just thought it was good timing because uh Paul Fennessy with the forty two had done an interview with, with Dickinson about it and he was saying how for Keane, like this whole thing of, you know, the great team spirit, it's not as if we're all like a brotherhood here where you it's just about what you want to win on the pitch mm. and that like when he, when he threw skulls under the bus but then I went back to that time and you go through what was happening at United when Ferguson had kind of said he was floating he was going to leave and all, and United had won three league titles in a row but then totally absolutely capitulated the next season and were an absolute nightmare of a club they were all over the place mm. you know with you signed Varon and Van Nistelrooy and stuff and you see what Keane is saying around that time, and then you, what you're saying about Ronaldo now, when you're like, is this the same person? That's uh, totally. And look at we're, we're, well, it's we're, very Teddy. Like, well, and we're also all contradictions it, like. at some point. Or oh, and if you're on the TV all the time saying stuff, I yeah, would. Yeah, I'd hate to be I know, yeah. re rewinding this show like. from, uh, from especially Johnny. Could you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> Johnny's best bits well, are be amazing. On that note, Cosmo Kramer on YouTube uh, says we need a weekly Ward and Sned chatting League of Ireland segment. So I'm all for it. Um, Thanks so much for coming in. No oh, bother. Pleasure to be here. David Snade, and that's a really good uh, read, by the way. If you're looking for something that sums up Shamrock Rovers' season, check out uh, David's writing on Stephen Bradley from during the week on the 42.ie.